My name is Steve with MIC Systems, and today we're going to be looking at the Commander software. Today is November 2nd, 2021, and we are presenting to 417. Tom, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Tom Arnold from 417 The Shop out of Ozark, Missouri. You're a V-Twin and Power Sports. Do you do metric bikes and Harleys, or what do you work on mostly? Uh, we, we do do some metrics, but we specialize in Harley-Davidson. I was a master tech for Harley-Davidson for 14 years. Awesome. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do what we would call a V-Twin demo, and we're going to be showing the Commander Software version 15.0, and that is the currently released version that we have of our software. So just to give you a quick background on who we are, the software, as you can see here, is called Commander. It's actually developed by MIC Systems which is the company that I represent. And we are a software developer based in Southern California. We actually have 42 years in business at this stage where we were established in 1979. We are still family owned, which is awesome. And we are at this stage in about 13 different countries. We have several thousand dealers. So we're not a small company. We're probably the largest supplier of Windows-based software in the power sports industry. Everybody else has moved to very sort of odd platforms, but we've elected to stay on a Windows platform. All right, as I mentioned, we're on a Windows platform. So at this stage, it's Windows 10, although I did notice that Microsoft just came out with Windows 11. So I'm not sure what that's gonna look like, but obviously if you're looking to host Commander, the less expensive way of doing this is to locally host it, which means you're going to run it on hardware that you already own. So that would be a desktop or a laptop or a tablet or something running a Windows operating system. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, it's going to be on Windows 10. Some people elect to put it on a server. We can cloud host it, although it does add quite a bit to the monthly cost. So I don't typically recommend that people do that, although it is an option. But typically, you're just taking a Windows 10 computer, loading Commander on it, and then if you need to connect additional devices, you can. So you can run one or multiple workstations locally hosting the data, as you can see here. And that would be the, the preferred way. You can run it on a tablet or a desktop or a laptop. Or, you know, if you leave the building and you go outside, you want to connect in from home, we can set up a VPN for you. And there's a very easy way to extend your network. VPN essentially is a virtual private network, which just extends your local network using the internet. So you don't have to be on a cloud hosted system to remote connect. And it's not a hokey connection like show my PC or whatever. It's a, it's a solid connection and it works just the same as if you were in the building. So that's a good thing. All our backups are done to cloud. We protect the data by backing it up. But the drives that we back up to typically are going to be cloud drives that you can access rather than having your data out in the cloud somewhere where you don't know where it is and you can't get to it. How many computers are you looking to run on, Tom? Probably about two to three. Two to three. So it'll be something in this configuration that you see on the screen here. And we'll come back to how pricing works when you're doing multiple computers. This slide I threw together, this is just to show that you can actually run Commander on a Mac. If somebody had a Mac computer, they could run it using a piece of software called Parallels, which essentially just creates a partition on the Mac for Windows software, and they run side by side. That's why they call it Parallels. But most of the Mac guys don't really want to put Windows software on their Mac, so they would end up buying a PC to run it. But it's not going to run on like an iPad or an iPhone or whatever. So we look at software just like a tool, right? To, to manage your business or to run your business, you have to have the right tools in your toolbox to do certain jobs, and it's no different with software. You've got different departments. You've got your parts department, your service department, your purchase orders that you create. Maybe you sell bikes on consignment, or if you were a dealer and you were selling bikes, you'd have a sales department. And then there's some back-end accounting that you have to do. And if you don't have the right software, to do it, it's just like not having the right tool in the toolbox to do a job. It's just not going to get done right. Or if it is, it's going to take two, three times as long to do it. So you end up really losing time if you don't have the right software. So we just say Commander is going to increase efficiency in every department because it is software specifically designed for the V-Twin industry. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. So price files is one of my first talking points. We have these price files available with, so with the software. And as a power sports dealer, you get your first 10 files at no additional cost. 
and we have a lot of these price files available. So these are some of the outdoor power equipment companies that we have, but of course you're a power sports dealer or a V-twin dealer. So the files would be Harley Davidson, for example, we can put a Harley file in there for you. Parts Unlimited would include the drag file if you wanted to load that. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you have an account with drag at this stage. Yeah, um, they're my main supplier. I also have Western Power Sports, WPS. I have Ted's B Twin. Um, and I also work with uh, Temecula Motorsports as my OEM uh, metric. So when you're getting your Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, we actually have a Honda file, as you can see. We have a Yamaha file, Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. So we would be loading these files in there for you. And, and essentially at that point, you have all those parts and prices loaded into the system. So you don't have to do all the manual entry. A lot of guys will go for Takaraki in the V-Twin industry because they have Biker's Choice product and their WPS, of course, has the hard drive product in it. And then there'll be companies like s, &S if you're a V-Twin guy, Mid-USA, Custom Chrome, Karyakin, you know, there's a bunch of them, right? So the cool part is our software is going to have all these parts and prices, and you can tell me later which ones you need, and we'll make sure we get those loaded in there for you. And the way this works is there's a little app that goes onto the, onto the desktop of the main computer. So right here in the middle is this little set of books here. This is our current delivery vehicle in terms of how we get the price updates to you. So whenever there's a new file for a vendor that you want to load or a distributor, you would come into this app and you would click on, you know, just as an example, if you wanted to load the latest Harley file. Mm -hmm. so this app is actually connected to our server here. And so it's pinging right now in real time. It's pinging the server to see if there's an update that's newer than the last file that I loaded. And it's showing me that the last file that I loaded was back in February. And there's a newer one available as of September 20th, there was a new one. And all I have to do is accept that file. This little red boxes are gonna actually be a way that I can tell that the data is actually different. And I accept that file and it loads all the new parts and downloads the latest price book and updates all my prices for me. So I'm gonna log into the software here. There's a little blue commander icon there. Everybody gets a username and a password and then you can log into the software like this. Um, it'll ask if you want to archive your inventory values. That's a new feature that we just released and the software will open up like this. In the top left corner, there's a nut and bolt here. This is where we go to see those price books that we just loaded. And there you go, right there, sitting teed up for us. And I actually used a the theme. There's, a, there's something in the software now called themes where you can use color coding. So it doesn't have to be orange and black, but I just picked orange as a theme for uh, my items list here, since this is a V-Twin demo. But these, yeah. yellow, these yellow folders that you see on the left-hand side here, these are some of the price books that this dealer has loaded or some of the inventory categories that he has. So he's going to have a Harley folder down here, and that's where all those Harley parts reside. They're actually sitting in this one folder right here. So we separate everything into little folders or categories as we call them and all the parts and prices are already in there. If you wanted to see CCI, Custom Chrome, you would click on that and there's all the CCI parts. If you wanted to go to Parts Unlimited, you click on that. And so the navigation is just a Windows style navigation, very comfortable for people because everybody's used to seeing folders. And every time you click on a folder, it just puts you in that section of the inventory. So when you're looking at an item, let's take this tech watch, whatever this is, you're gonna see a part number. This is a parts unlimited item. There's a UPC code. That's the barcode that's actually on the actual product. So what that means is I can pick up a scanner and I can scan any parts unlimited or drag item, Harley item, whatever, and it's gonna come right up because we've, we're working with barcode data. The UPC codes are already in there and that's the barcode that's already on the part. So I'm gonna take that barcode as if I was putting this item into the system for the first time as a stocked item. I would scan it. It's going to come right up. I'm going to put in my stock, let's say of two and save it and I'm done. And I mean, that's how quick it is in terms of putting in your inventory. So that just became a stock inventory item. You can see it changed to inventory over here on the right hand side. 
So imagine adding inventory to a system that doesn't have the price book loaded in it. You'd have to type in the part number. You'd have to type in or scan in the UPC code, type in the description, enter the cost, enter the sell price, put in your stock. You know, it's going to take you a couple of minutes just to put in one item, whereas we can do it in a couple of seconds like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you customize your pricing for some reason, you don't sell at the same price that Drag says you should sell at, and you put a bump on your prices, you can do that. You can go into these folders and you can put in formulas, and that'll escalate your sell price to whatever you want it to be. Sometimes it's cost plus a percentage if you're working with tires that are really competitive. Sometimes you're creating special special prices for the internet or whatever the case might be or maybe for other shops that buy from you. And so we have nine special price points over here on the left, in addition to your regular sell price. You can put in a bin location if you want to put in a bin. So let's say I keep this item in you know, bin 5-A or whatever the case might be. So now I've put in a location for the item as well. Now what about for with cost? I know my drag specialties have at, at different tiers, whether it be silver, gold, platinum, all that stuff, the costs change on certain items. I'm glad I'm demoing you and I knew you were going to ask good questions. And so I'm really glad we're recording this demo, to be honest, because that's an awesome question. So the, the first thing is that obviously there's different price files. So if you're a silver or gold or platinum dealer, that's the file that that's going to be loaded for you. So you'll get the platinum file that will have those costs in it. But as you know, Drag also has these things called dealer picks, which are special, mm -hmm. yeah, special pricing that they give you on special items. And so we have actually done the work of developing an app that's called a warehouse locator. And this app was actually first developed just to download the warehouse counts. The idea behind it was, you know, wouldn't it be great if when you were looking up an item in Commander, you could see whether you stocked it. And if you didn't have it in stock, wouldn't it be great if you could see right there on the spot whether they had it and what warehouse it might be coming from? So that's what this app was designed to do originally. Originally, when it was designed, it was just designed to do the stock, to pull the stock counts from the different warehouses for drag. It also does it for Tucker, and it also does it for WPS. So those three companies and Automatic and a few other companies but here we're looking at Parts Unlimited. When this app is now set up, we also have the ability to update prices. So you click this little box, you put your dealer number in here, and when this app runs, and it's gonna run on a timer, it now connects to the drag servers and pulls on a timer every single day, it pulls your dealer pick pricing into the system in addition to the warehouse counts. And I'll yeah. tell you, man, when we did that feature for people, guys were going, man, that's it. Now you guys have got it. Because even if they update the prices at midnight, the night before, you're gonna come in the next morning and your dealer pick pricing is gonna be accurate in the system. And you don't have to do anything. This thing will run on a scheduler, automatically on a timer, update the prices, and you're good to go. So that's what that is all about. So let's come back in here for a second and I'll show you a little bit about how this also works because we created a cross-reference. We have a number of cross-references that we're gonna to wanna to talk about before we leave the items section. But the first one I'm gonna look up is just an oil filter, which is a KN111. And I'll do a quick search for that. And you'll notice it comes up and it shows me I can get that from Parts Unlimited as a KN111, but Tucker sells it as a 401450 and WPS actually sells it as a 56 0111. So we created a cross reference that even if you're looking for a KN111, is going to find it under the other suppliers that carry it, even though they, they have a completely different part number for the item. And then you're going to be able to see who has it at the best price. I'm going to zero out my stock here and just pretend I don't have it from any, any one of the three. So I might have an account with Parts Unlimited, Tucker, and WPS, but I can actually see that I don't stock the item. My, my stock is zero. But if I'm on the WPS item like this, the 56 item, 56 dash item here, I can click uh -huh. down here on the warehouse button. And that's going to show me the stock that they have in their Boise warehouse, just as an example. 
or nine or above. They use nine, right? Every time there's nine or more in the other warehouses that they have. If I look at Tucker and click show warehouse, that's going to show me the Tucker warehouses, five in Pennsylvania. If I click on parts unlimited, it's going to do the same thing. I can also mm -hmm. I can also compare their cost to see who has it at the best price. Nice. So imagine imagine being able to type in one little part number, huh, be able to see three different companies you can get it from, who has the best price, and see their warehouse information all in one spot, and 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 do that all in a matter of seconds, as opposed to having to log into each individual website, look it up, search for the item, research it. You'll spend 15 minutes researching it to discover that you could have saved, you know, maybe a quarter if you'd ordered it from WPS, just as an example in this case. And, right. and of course, a lot of the items have, you know, quite significant price discrepancies between the companies, depending on who you buy them from. So this particular cross-reference that we built was a pretty good one because it gives you the ability to to cross shop. And in many cases, of course, Parts Unlimited is going to be the the least expensive because they're the bigger company and they really do have good pricing. But that's the first cross reference that we built. The second cross reference was we had one of our dealers send us all the catalogs like the V-Twin catalog and the drag catalog and whatever. And all that data that's in the back of the books that crosses over the Harley number to the aftermarket number was imported into Commander through this cross-reference loader that we have here. And the net result of that is when I'm looking for an item like a roller bearing, here's a Harley roller bearing, right? So I'm looking for a 9052. I can go down to the item reference tab down at the bottom here, and I'm going to see all that cross-reference data sitting all teed up for me in the back here. So I can see that that 9052 roller bearing is available from Custom Chrome. It was a, there was a Harley Davidson number that was a 9033 that was superseded to the 9052. There's a mid USA number for it. And then depending on if you're looking for the whole bearing or just the, the race or you know whatever, or the kit, these prices are going to be different, but you can figure that out because you know what those items are. But you can see the DS number for it. You can see the V-twin number for it. And that's really helpful because you don't have to scratch around in the back of the catalogs every time you're looking up an OEM number trying to figure out if you can get it somewhere else. Again, you can see the cost prices. You can see if you have one in stock under any one of those numbers. And so that data was was super, super helpful to our V-Twin dealers is to have the cross-reference data from the back of the catalogs all harvested and imported into our system. Any comments on that or? No, that's really good. Yeah, we think that's a pretty good feature. So in 2011, just to kind of go off script here for just a second, in 2011, we went to the V-Twin Expo and for the very, very first time, in the history of the V-Twin market, we presented these products. We showed the pricing and the cross-reference. We also went there with this guy here. This is Tony from Ronnie's Harley-Davidson. A lot of people use Ronnie's for their their lookup. They go onto Ronnie's website to look yeah, up. Do you, Ronnie's Microfish. Yeah, do you go on Ronnie's? Yeah. So the Ronnie's product is actually developed by a friend of mine, Nick Arnone. And Nick has this company called HLSM, and that's actually his product that's on the Ronnie's website. So we're there with Tony. Tony's actually selling parts to the V-Twin shops at dealer Harley dealer cost plus, I don't know, 15% or whatever they were doing back then. Harley stopped it. Harley put an end to it. They wouldn't allow him to continue it. And I actually went home with this T-shirt that you see here. We had so many dealers because not only could we, we provide the parts at a discount, we had the dealer management software. And in addition to that, we had the, the fish product, the HLSM fish product. And we also had the Harley Davidson labor times and service schedules, which I'm going to be showing you as part of this demo today. So that's part of what so those doing. are built into this too. We've got three products that work hand in hand that are integrated. So it's not built into our software, but they're optional products, subscription products that you can subscribe to. 
and I'm going to show you how those work. So as you make a decision about you know what you feel you want to sign up for and what your monthly budget is, I'll show you near each product and then how you can try them. There's a trial that you can take on a couple of them for 30 days and then what the monthly cost is. Both of those products, the, the fish product and the labor guide product, they're both around $50 a month as a subscription and they don't have an upfront cost. So let's just get moving here on the demo. I'm gonna take an item, I'll go back to Parts Unlimited since that's the item that we were using. And I'm gonna sell something as if somebody walked in and wanted to buy an item. Here's, here's an item that I have one of. And let's pretend that somebody came in to buy this item on an invoice and they, we were just selling it right across the parts counter. So on the left-hand side, you'll see this little cash register here. And every time I click somewhere in Commander, it's going to open up a tab at the top. And this is the grid of all my invoices. Now, again, I'm using color coding. And the color coding in this particular case, I, the way I've elected to use it is green tickets. All the green shaded ones are my parts invoices. And all the blue ones are my bike sales. So I can see which ones I sold the bike on. And the green ones are my parts sales because everything is sold, if it, whether it's a bike or whether it's parts or helmets or jackets or whatever, we go through the cash register to ring them up. So I'm gonna start a brand new ticket. And this would be somebody walking up to the parts counter wanting to buy an item. You pick up your scanner, you scan the item, you go to the checkout window and you collect your money. And that whole process, you could just click invoice right there. That whole process of using a scanner and selling something takes between five and seven seconds, and you can sell somebody a part across the counter, which is really fast. A lot of systems have a lot of clicks and a lot of different things going on before you can sell something. Now, if you wanna add your customer to the system, you know, he's a brand new guy, you've never done business with him before, there's a new button up in the top left and you can click on that and you can put in customer information, the guys, first name, last name, phone number, all that kind of stuff. Obviously, if he's somebody that's been in your shop before, I'm just typing in Jones as Anthony, select his name, go to the checkout window. Hey, Tony, that's gonna be 1067. How are you paying me? He says, I'm gonna give you cash. Here's 20 bucks, add the payment. 933 is the change down there at the bottom. And then we go ahead and print the invoice. You can also email the ticket if you want to. Because it was a cash sale, it's prompting me to give him his change back. You can see there the customer change would be 933. Mm -hmm. And it prints an invoice. So there you go. Nice. Yeah, your logo would be up here at the top. It barcodes it. There are some people that elect to print on the little grocery store slip receipt. So if you decided you want to save a little money on toner cartridge or whatever, we can actually use one of the little thermal printers or the little slip printers that you see, almost like a credit card receipt or a grocery store style receipt. Mm -hmm. And it prints that receipt style that you see there. All right, so coming back to the slides real quick, these are marine price files that we have here. We have price files for golf cars. If you ever get a golf car in, Chat a little bit about scanners very quickly. We have these wireless barcode scanners. They're Honeywell 1902 scanners. These guys sell for about $800 new. So we found that the used ones work just as well as the new ones. And so we sell the refurbished scanners and we have a bunch of these in stock. If you decide you wanna get a scanner, it's not a bad idea. Once the price books are loaded, you can really use the scanners a lot because a lot of the product, as you can see, has UPC codes with the price books that we're loading. Now, if you don't have a price book loaded and you go buy some generic software like Shop Monkey or Garage Monkey or Di <laughs> Digital Wrench or Fishbowl or, man, there's a lot of them out there that are trying to do business in the space and pretty much have no clue what they're doing. You, you won't really be able to deploy the scanners very well because there's a lot of manual entry with those systems, just like they would be with QuickBooks. This scanner comes with a charging dock. That means when you put it in this little gray piece on the left-hand side here, it recharges. So it's pretty much always ready to go. And it's great for selling parts, receiving parts, putting them on a service ticket. And you can even take physical inventory with the scanner, walk around the store and it collects data to the scanner and you can dump it in when you're taking an inventory. 
All right. If you want to print your own barcode labels, remember mm -hmm. that there's going to be a barcode on most of the product already. But we do sell these barcode printers. The current printer that we are selling is a Zebra GX420 that you see here. Again, these are refurbished because of the brand new ones. I've seen them for as high as $800. So not a bad idea to get the used printers. FedEx, UPS have been using these for a long time. There's two older models that also work. The Zebra LP2844. They don't make those anymore, but there's a bunch of them out there. And the Zebra ZP450. So I'm showing all three models, but any one of those printers, if you pick one up, will print these parts labels that you see here on the left. Right from Commander, prints a customer address label if you want to. It prints a serialized bike label with your make model on it. It does a barcoded service tag if somebody's dropping a bike off for service. And it also does a, there's one more label that does, it also does a label for special order parts that are coming in for a customer prints the customer's name on it and so forth. So, you know, we're big fans of, of the barcoding piece. And then that printer that we were just talking about a moment ago for printing the thermal receipts, like I just showed you, requires one of these Star TSP143 Eco. It's the less expensive one, and they're around 249 These are brand new. These are not refurbished, but they would give you your slip printer, or your slip receipt, and you could also tie it together with a cash drawer. But these guys don't use any toner cartridge or ribbons or whatever. So if you do high volume parts business, these pay for themselves fairly quickly because you're not having to replenish your toner cartridge that often uh, like you would if you were using a laser printer. These will hook to a cash drawer like you see here. And those are sort of optional features just in terms of how you print your receipts if you want these receipts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that piece. Okay. And I'm going in detail, obviously, because I'm recording this and I want to make sure we cover everything, but I'll try and keep it moving for you. So we go back to the items screen here. Actually, let's go to that item in the invoicing screen. Right here, we can take it as an item. And we'll refresh this item. Now notice, because we sold it, our stock has dropped to zero. We used to have one in stock. Now we can see the stock up here and the stock down here is zero. So it took it out of stock for us. And it also records the sales history down here at the bottom. So there's a sales history tab. Anytime you're wondering where something went, you knew you had one or you thought you had one, and now there's zero, you go down to the sales history and you view it. You can put in the starting and ending date. Right now, I'm just looking at the current month, which is November. And I can see that I've sold one. This is the customer I sold it to. This is the date I sold it. This is the invoice that it was on. My cost was... 650 and my sale price was 995. So I actually generated a $3.45 profit. It's a 53% gross profit. And this is going to accumulate as you sell that item over time. So you're going to be able to look at any starting date that you select. If you want to go back to last year or put in custom dates or you know the last 30 days, 60, 90, whatever you decide you wanna do, you're going to be able to see how many of that particular item you've sold. And that, that's really helpful if you're trying to make decisions on stocking levels, like how many should I have? How many of that item should I carry? So from the items screen here, if you look at the bottom, there's a detail tab. And the detail tab down at the bottom lets us set our stocking levels. So in this particular case, we're using a min-max. And this is very much like bread, milk, and eggs. There's certain things you don't want to run out of. So you set a minimum stocking level and a maximum. So 4 and 12, if I get below 4, I want to order back to 12. That's how the min-max works. One-to-one -one buyback mm -hmm. would just replenish the item if I sold it. And those are going to be for things like you know spark plugs, oil, gaskets, filters, things you know you don't want to run out of. So as soon as the stocking level is low and you're below your minimum, you can actually run a stock order on the orders tab based on your min maxes, and it's going to pick up all the items that you're low on and send them to a suggested order. So that's how it's designed, and it really is helpful because that way you don't run out of items. You don't have to walk around the store and shake the boxes, or you don't have to guess at how many you've sold within a certain period of time because you have that sales history tab down there at the bottom. Now, if I was selling this item and I didn't have it in stock, it could be a jacket or a helmet or somebody want, you know, something that somebody wanted you to do a special order for them. You could go to the invoicing program, right mouse click, new ticket here, and let's say we're selling that item. Now, we know we don't have it, 
So we're putting the item onto the ticket. And actually a better way to demo this because ordinarily you would have the warehouse information down there at the bottom. I'm going to use a different item. I'm going to use that, that Western Power Sports 56-0111. So that's that filter. And again, I hit the WPS item, but notice how it pulled the Tucker and Parts Unlimited item too. Even though I started out looking for the WPS item, those items are cross-linked. So I might have that item under the Parts Unlimited number, in which case I could have selected it and sold that one. But in this case, I can see I don't have any. So I'm going with WPS and I'm telling my customer, hey, I don't have that filter in stock. Do you want me to order it for you? And so of course he's gonna say, well, yeah, I definitely need it, but how soon can I get that? At that point, I click on my warehouse button down here at the bottom and I say, you know, I've got some in my warehouse in Boise. I can have that for you by, you know, Thursday. And he right. says, so I don't have to, I mean, the, the customer experience at this point is really great because I don't have to say, well, you know, hold on a sec. Let me log into WPS or Tucker's or, you know, Dragnet Web or whatever and take a look. You've got that information right there at your fingertips. So we're going to go ahead and put that item on an invoice for somebody here. We'll choose a customer. Go to the checkout window. And at this point, we need to collect a deposit. Now, the system typically has 100% deposit defaulting. So you're telling your customer, hey, this is a special order item, so I have to get prepaid. That's our store policy. It's going to be 943. And of course, if you know the guy real well, you want to zero out the deposit, or maybe you want to take 50%, that's up to you. You can do that on the fly. Your payment methods are up here on the left, cash, check, debit card, credit card. So let's say he's putting it on a credit card and he wants to use his visa. And we're going to go ahead and collect his money. So we go ahead and we process the payment. We print his ticket. And actually what I'd like to do here is just flip it back to a eight and a half by 11 ticket so that we can see the detail on the ticket. So I'm just gonna reprint it. And you don't have to do this every single time. I mean, you just select your print style based on the printer that you're using and then it defaults to that moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the receipt that printed for the special order item. And what you're going to see right in the middle is you can see the special order detail there. And the total due on pickup is zero. And that's because the guy paid me or he prepaid me for the item. So whatever the deposit arrangement was is going to dis display right there in the middle of the special order ticket. All right, that item for customer Ryan Arstead is marked as a special order item. So if you look in the right-hand side, you can see the red flag on the right-hand side in the status column there. It's letting me know that that's a special order item. And it actually has that red flag on the invoice on the side there, you see that? Right mm -hmm. here, right here. Yep. That item is actually sent to something called the PO pad. So if we go to the top left-hand corner, this is our digital clipboard. I don't know how you run your shop, but a lot of people have clipboards laying around in the shop. And when they need to order something for a job or for a customer, they're writing it down on the clipboard. I've got to figure out, I've got a new phone here. I've got to figure out how to put this thing on busy. There we go. I just found the DND button. Aha, we're in business. Right on. <laughs> so up in the top left is the PO pad. So instead of you having to use like, you know, clipboards and write everything down, we're doing this electronically. We're writing all the items down. So this item here that needs to be ordered is going to already be on the PO pad. It's already been sent to a digital notepad. Here it is here. And you can see the customer's name. You can see it came from invoice 33. It's a special order item that has to be ordered from WPS. So at some point in time, we're going to come to the PO pad and we're going to create our purchase orders. But it's doing the work of writing everything down for you so that you don't have to do that manually. So that's another process that we're taking care of for you. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're going to go to service, and this is where the demo gets a lot more interesting because I think as a Harley Master Tech, and you've used, I think you said you'd used Talon before, right? I was a part of the beta uh, program on building Talon ES. That's awesome. Well, most of the Harley franchise dealers are on Talon now, of course, and our business is primarily written with B-Twin independent, and, you know, independent dealers. Okay, so we're looking over on the left-hand navigation panel here, and you're going to see a repair order icon, and this is where we click to start our service tickets. So all our service work is done here, 
the cash register above that was for selling items. And so we separate the service work from the regular part sales. And the reason being, if you look at the grid itself, there's more information on the service panel. You know, the date the job started, the work order number, the customer's name, the year make model VIN number, mileage of the bike at the time that the service was done. And then some status information on the right-hand side. Was it just an estimate? I'm using my color coding there to highlight my estimates in yellow. So when I'm looking at my grid, you know, I'm just looking at that and I know that that yellow one, you know, I didn't get that job. That was just a, an estimate. But we have another status called a posted ticket and the posted ticket is an open work order. And those are the ones that you usually shade green or whatever. So when you're looking at the grid, the color coding is really helpful because it helps you know which tickets are open, which tickets have been completed. You can filter them out. I mean, if you just want to look at closed work orders, you click here and it filters out everything except the completed ones. If you have a lot of open jobs in this panel, which you will, you could filter them out by just clicking on posted. In this case, I only have one, but you would have a whole grid populated of open work orders. But the color coding was introduced to make it so that when you clicked on all, you can eyeball the stuff really, really easily and you can see uh, which tickets are currently open and which ones are not. So we want to get started. I want to see if I have a customer very quickly that has a Harley that he owns. And if, and if we don't, we're going to sell somebody a Harley. So I'm going to take a quick look here. This is my unit screen. So where I clicked was on this red and blue key on the left hand side here. And this is where all the serialized units go. So I have just as an example, a different inventory module for the parts, the jackets, the helmets, the accessories, they're all in this section. And then underneath, mm -hmm. underneath that, this is a separate inventory module for all of the, the bikes. So I've got a couple of bikes in here actually that are stock units that are in the system. Right. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at how we sell a bike in the system. And do you do any bike sales at all on consignment or, or at all or not? Not at the moment. Okay, so I'll do this very, very quickly. I've got two bikes that are stock units here. There's no customer name associated with them. I'm going to take them to the invoice as if I was going to sell them, open up the ticket, pop the VIN number onto the actual invoice like this. I'm going to put a customer's name on here. I can put the fees on here if I want to. I can put the trade-in unit on here. So it's designed to handle all of the components of a sale from title to, you know, any other fees, rebates, dealer dock fee, trade-in, all of those things can be added. And they all have preset pricing or you can change the pricing. There's a module I'm not going to show you now, but there is an additional sales calculator that does the financial calculations, calculates the guy's monthly payment based on the loan term and the APR and also populates all of your sales forms if you were doing DMV forms or whatever. But just in the interests of this demo, since most V Twin Shops don't get into that too heavily, I'm just going to go into the checkout window here. The total is 13618 and I'm going to say the Guy writes me a check, pay it, and invoice it. So I just sold the bike. That's what I just did. So I'm selling it to a customer, Ryan Heineke here, and it's mm -hmm. going to it's going to print my ticket. So this is the bike sale. Done deal. Simple. Awesome. Yeah, nice and easy. So if you ever get into that. And notice how it shaded it blue because it has a bike on it. It's not a green shading. See the difference? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go to my service ticket, right mouse click, new ticket, and I'm going to pretend that this customer, Ryan Heineke, came in for service. I'm going to start a new ticket by searching for his name. And I could search by phone number. I could search by first name, last name. It doesn't really matter. And that puts his name on the ticket right there on the left-hand side. Now I go mm -hmm. across to the right to see what bike he actually owns. And I do a search here. And look at that. There's the bike that we just sold him. So there's that Harley Softail Classic we just sold him. He also had a Honda dirt bike. So he's out in uh, Reno, Nevada. So I guess he likes being on the road and he likes being off the road. 
but there is, right. yeah. So if you have a customer that has more than one bike, two, three, four units, you'll be able to select the one that you're servicing, or you could add a new one right here. So there, you know, you come in here, you don't see the guy's bike and you want to enter it, you open up the screen like this and you'd have to input the VIN, your make model and so forth and put the guy's bike into the system and it would add it to the guy's profile right here. But in this case, I'm just going to select the actual unit that's already there. Up in the top right corner, there's an edit button and you can go in there if you want to edit any of the bike information, including things like add pictures if you wanted to. So maybe you want to document a repair procedure by adding photographs. Maybe it's a crash coming in for an estimate and you want to take before and after pictures for the insurance company. There's a variety of different reasons why you might want to take uh, pictures. Maybe you're doing a custom build for the guy and you want to document that through the process. So you can load one image or you can load multiple images just by double clicking there and adding a picture. So that's a pretty cool feature, um, especially if the guy's taillight is broken or there's a dent in his fuel tank and you don't want to get blamed for it. That's another reason why you might want to take a picture. And then down at the bottom, there's also a URL feature. There's an image URL. This will link to any website that you want to link the unit to. Uh, some people are using that to shoot a video with their phone as they talk to the guy and he drops off his bike. You know, hey, hey Ryan, tell me, what, what are we doing for you today? And you just take a quick video and you video the bike, walk around it once as you check it in. Um, there's a variety of different ideas there on how to use that feature. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're doing service, right? So we're dropping off. Yeah. That's the drop off. Top left hand corner, you're going to see a green tab. This is where we're going to type in whatever the guy says he needs done. So maybe he's coming in for an oil change. He needs a new new front tire. You know, that's what he thinks he needs. These are going to be notes that, of course, are just free form notes. Some people are voice texting into there or set, hooking up a headset. It's a little hit or miss. The Windows voice texting, uh, voice recognition software is getting better as it as it advances. Recommendations can be typed in down here at the bottom if you decide you want to put in some additional recommendations, there's a spot to do that as well. Okay. All right, so now we could print it. He could sign it. There's a disclaimer he would sign and he leaves my shop and I'm in estimate mode, as you can see. See how it says in the middle there, I'm just doing an estimate. So anything, uh -huh. anything that I add to this bike as I start putting the parts and labor on here is initially just for the purposes of creating the guy's estimate. It's not gonna affect my inventory levels or anything until I want it to. So step number one, let's say I wanted to type in a part number like a 9052. That would be one way of putting a part on there, right? I could do the roller bearing and look at that. I get my cross reference and I'm like, okay, I needed that Harley 9052 roller bearing, but I know I can get that from drag. So I'm going to select that item instead. And it immediately subs out the Harley item for the drag item. Right now. So I guess my question is with the service running software, and doing estimates, do you not have specific line items? Like say if you're, you know, doing an estimate and you have, you know, a three job work orders such as oil change, rear tire and front tire, you know, up, oh, you know, need wheel bearings, gonna put it on the front tire line of the, the work order. Does it not segregate out um, each job on the work order? So it will segregate the jobs. That's another great question. There's a tasking feature over here on the right hand side that you can that you can use to do that. And I'm right here is this, this tasking feature. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'll segregate it for you once I have some stuff on there. There is a way to start each labor operation code with with its own, with its own task. So and that, and that also depends on how I'm going to get the labor on here, which is something I want to show you. So I'll bookmark your question and I'll come back and I'll show you how it separates everything because it does do segregation. It does separate the jobs and it does give you separate subtotals for each job if you use that feature. Right now, I just put a, a roller bearing on there to show that the cross reference is available inside of the work order screen so that as you're adding items, You've got that cross-reference data just like you did in the items screen also working inside of the service ticket, which allows you to easily sub out items and get to a different item if you were subbing out the Harley item for a drag item in this case, right? And then I would also have the warehouse information down at the bottom. So if I was doing that 56-0111, 
just as an example, that's a WPS item. And I put that on there. I can click down at the bottom to make sure that they have stock available in their warehouse. And that's also working inside the work order. So I'm choosing- Does that build, does that build a, an order in WPS or in drag? Do that or do you got to go back and, and put it to your drag or WPS back well, end? If I looked at that item and I noticed that they didn't have any stock, I wanted to use the WPS 56-0111 and I came to the warehouse information and they didn't have it in the warehouse that was closer to me. I could close the warehouse. I could go down to similar or related items and click on this little blue button down here at the bottom. And then I could choose, let's say, the Tucker item, just as an example. And now I can see the Tucker warehouses. Right, but when you collect and select that part, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't build into the back end of like your 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 merchant uh, back end that like drag or something. It doesn't like create or add it to an order, right? Well, no, it's going to. It's going to add it to an okay. order. It's going to add it okay. to an order, but right now, remember, I'm just in estimate mode. So, right, it's, so it's not doing that, but right. it does integrate going, like that. It's going to integrate. That is correct. So I'm just showing, oh. you, I'm showing you the different methods of getting an item. So either I can type it on, I can scan it on. I've got access to the entire price books inside here. If I want to look up a price book, I could go in and I could grab items from a price book. But typically what's going to happen is you're going to be using Ronnie's or you're going to be using HLSM if you choose to subscribe to it. So this product that I'm showing you is the same product that's on Ronnie's website, but this is the paid version of it. And they get, I think, 50 bucks a month for this product. But what's cool about it is it's not just Harley Davidson. It's got everything from Articat down to Yamaha. And of course, uh -huh. Harley Davidson right here in the middle. So if I navigate into it, I'm not, I'm not going through Ronnie's website at this particular point to get to the data. I get my model listing, as you see on the left-hand side here, and I would click on my Heritage Softail Classic here. And let's say I'm looking at the carburetor assembly. So I'm getting to my schematics this way, which you know used to be called Microfish, or I could also get to them for free on Ronnie's. We know we can go on Ronnie's and get to them that way too. So essentially, this is doing the same thing that Ronnie's would do, bringing you to the OEM part number. But here's where it's a little bit different. If I click on, let's say, this intake manifold seal here, it's actually going to look in Commander to see if I have it and what price it would be available at. And it's looking at the Harley data that's in my system. And it's showing me that, that if I got that as a Harley item, it would be 225. I don't have it in stock. This dollar sign right here lets me know I've never actually stocked that item before. And this button right here is going to show me how many Harley Davidson street bikes share that part. So this particular item uh, has been used on multiple models. And so when you click there, that does the fitment search. And it shows me there's 203 different models all the way from an 86 Sportster on forward, right on down to a, this is the model listing here, right on down to a 99. And mm -hmm. so that item is, that's the, the 203 models that that part will fit or could be used on. You can export the fitment list, and a lot of people will do that if they're selling parts on eBay or Amazon or whatever. You want to be able to list it, not just under the one bike. A lot of the salvage guys or used part guys, you know, want the fitment list because they want to know how many bikes, you know, if I've got a part laying there, I want to know that it can be used on a particular model. So that's the fitment list. Now what I can do is I can start building a pick list. It's telling me I need two. So, you know, I would go two. And I'm just going to click on a handful of items. I can take this ring. And this is, of course, right now just looking at the OEM number. It's not looking at aftermarket parts. It's not looking at, you know, V-twin or drag parts. We're simply working with the OEM number. So I'm picking everything from the carburetor to the manifold to, you know, pretty much everything I need here. And I'm just going to pick you know, just a handful of items just for the purposes of the demo. So I've got five items that I'm picking and I'm really just creating a little shopping cart of items. And those are the OEM parts that are in what I would call my pick list. These are the parts that I've selected. 
So if you were using Ronnie's, you'd have to copy and paste the items over and you know either retype them or copy and paste them from Ronnie's into the Commander work order. But doing it this way, I can just post them, drop down into my work order. And then if you look top dead center, there's an orange arrow that says import at the top. And if I tap that button, those parts drop right in. And that's my starting point is to bring in the actual Harley parts, the OEM parts, because everything that's cross-reference related hinges off the Harley number. So the first thing you're going to see is this line in line four actually has a part number next to a part number like that. And so it pushes, mm -hmm. it pushes the description to the right. And that's because it's a superseded number. The A has been superseded by a B. And as soon as I clicked on line four, two buttons lit up down at the bottom, the red button and the blue button. The red button says superseded. So if I was to click on that, that's going to allow me to select the current Harley number and select that, and it'll replace that with the current number, which is the B, right? But if I click on the blue button, that's going to allow me an aftermarket choice. And I could get that item apparently from Parts Unlimited, V-Twin, or Custom Chrome. So I'm going to go with Parts Unlimited, select that, and that subs out that line for so now I threw away the Harley part and I've got the parts unlimited item in said, instead. And again, next line item, well, I've got quite a few choices on that next one. You know, so maybe I would be choosing, you know, WPS for that one. Mm -hmm. Next line item, that's a superseded item, but there's no blue button. So I've got to stay with the Harley number and get the current Harley number there. And then I got an aftermarket choice. Oh, I could actually get that from Ted's V Twin. The next one superseded. You can see the number next to the number, the A superseded by the B. And that's NLA. That shows me that's no longer available. And this next one. Mid USA. But that's just an example of how the cross-reference interactively can help you discover aftermarket products as you're creating your estimates and bringing them in from the microfiche. And if you were to look at the amount of time it would take you to dig in the books and discover what I just did in a matter of 60 seconds, it might take you a half hour. Maybe not you, you know, as a master tech, I don't know. But, but what, we've, what we've done is we've made it so that you don't have to, on each item, have to go into the back and try and figure out where you can get it from. And, oh, it's not available from drag. Let me look in the V-Twin catalog. Let me look in the WPS catalog. And you're flipping through in each case to see uh, if that item would be available. So that's how we handle the parts. It's very, very unique. And it's very much designed to accommodate the V-Twin industry, as you can tell. I mean, there's a lot of thought and a lot of power built into the backbone, which this T Talon would not have, Talon would not have even had this feature because they would have no desire to steer you away from the Harley. Right, anything other than Harley Davidson parts. Exactly, exactly. So now we get to labor, right? So I can put in labor if I want to, that's one way of doing it. I can just type in labor and the labor line drops onto the ticket at my current shop rate. And this customer is apparently set as a cost customer. So I'm going to just change it here. Okay, so we're going at 85 bucks an hour. Some of these customers are set up as cost customers. So that's what I'm dealing with here. But anyway, we'll just keep going. So the one way of doing labor is you type in a labor code and then you would manually enter it. You know, you'd be typing in the detail. And these fields are going to open up. They're dynamic fields, and so they open up and they give you plenty of room uh, if you have, you know, lengthy labor descriptions. And that's the one way of putting labor on there. You can move the lines around. If you wanted the labor up here at the top, I'll show you how the, the uh, tasking feature works in just a second. But again, we're still in estimate mode. The next thing we want to take a look at is this uh, Service Manager Pro product. So I want to I want to take a look at Service Manager Pro here. So we're going to log into SNP. And this is the other product that we took with us when we went to the VTwin Expo.
and we're going to go to motorcycles and you're going to see all these different brands right everything from aprilia bmw can-am ducati so we're going to harley and we are working on a 95 and you're going to choose your model Diagnostic trouble codes, of course, are going to be in here. And these are all your B, B codes, C codes, P codes, radio codes, and U codes. So all the blinks and sensors and probable causes are, are listed here for you for each model. Right. I'll come back to labor times in just a second. The service specifications are going to be your torque settings and fluid levels. And so everything from top end ignition specs, clutch and brakes, drive specs. Yeah. So you can see the bolt torque, yeah. wheel specs, suspension specs, right down to your fluids and fluid levels. Uh -huh. So, you know, this data, I don't know, you know, as a, as a master tech, you probably are familiar with a lot of this stuff, but when you're working on older models or whatever, you know, that data is pretty valuable to have. Now, if we're working on, I'm just going to choose a slightly newer model because a lot of the newer models also have service schedules. So if you go, you nice. know, if the guy comes in and he says he wants an oil change and you go, Ryan, listen, man, you're at 15,000 miles and, you know, Harley recommends at 15,000 miles, you've got to have a, a 15K service done. And so we're printing the the accepted services or the re recommended services, if you wish, for a 15K service. And it prints this list for you. And, it, and it's cool because you can give the guy or yourself or whatever, or a different tech maybe that works for you, you know, this is the stuff I need you to do. This is the 15K service on a 2013 electric glide. And so you go down, you're checking lights, you're checking switches and levers and, you know, all this kind of stuff, cables. And you're checking off anything that you find, of course, that needs to be done. This is an opportunity for you to upsell for that particular service. Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty cool feature too, as you go through and you're doing the actual 15K service, make some comments at the bottom. It prints all the related service specifications that you need to do a 15K service. And also if there are any factory or OEM parts, in that case, it was just the uh, air cleaner or whatever else that you might need. So the service schedules are in here, which is which is kind of cool. Good upsell opportunity. And then we get to the labor times. So when we're clicking in on labor times, this is a, a subject that you'll have probably a pretty strong opinion about. And so you probably will know better than I would. But when you're clicking on a section of the bike that you're working on here, depending on what it is that you're working on, The way this is designed is it's designed to give you three different labor rates. So there's a 75, an 85, and a 95. Now, if your shop just has one labor rate, you set your labor rate and you'll just have one column of pricing. The next thing is the time that displays. And most dealers that I've encountered, and I've been doing this over 30 years, so I feel like I have an opinion, but you'll have one too. A lot of the dealers are putting at least 50% on the flat rate time. So if you look at an hour, they're going to do it at an, you know, they're going to bill out an hour and a half. Yeah, we, we do, we, even in dealerships, I mean, we do by year bump, of course, you know, every, you know, we take the flat rate time on a one year old bike and bump it by 1.25. And of course, a five year bike would be a 1.5 and anything over 10 years, it's, you know, 1.75 bump and on older stuff, like, <laughs> 80s and back i mean it's a time in scenario on a lot of stuff because just you get into too much you're doing old 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 bikes like i just got done doing a 1979 um a harley davidson shovel head did a starter on it and you know it's kind of hard to tell a guy what the flat rate time is because you go in and you know you run into this bolts you know broke you run into this hole needs a helicoil this needs that and this and that so i mean you know, I, I definitely understand labor time bumps and didn't like doing warranty work, um, you know, in dealerships because of that, you know, but that's, that's, you know, was the name of the game. I always tell people be careful because if you don't have the right tool to bill out the correct labor time, 
a lot of the independent shops are really, really cutting them or selling themselves short because they'll make sure their labor rate is less than than the Harley shop. And, you know, they go in and they say, okay, you know, the labor rate's going to be 65 or 75 bucks an hour. Now, I, I don't think yours is probably that. I mean, you're a master tech, so you probably are, are billing a little bit more. But a lot of these guys will have a really low labor rate because they want to be less than the dealership. And then on top of that, they're underbilling for the time increment. So they're kind of burning the candle at both ends and really shorting themselves on the labor times. So, yeah, I can feel that. Yeah. So the way this works is, you know, you put, you go into the settings of the program, you put in that multiplier. And then, you know, if you're a $95 an hour shop, you're clicking on this 142 price here. And that's what essentially is getting picked as a labor job. So it's almost like we're in Ronnie's and we're picking, you know, we're picking these jobs in here. And I'm just going to pick a couple little jobs here. And it creates a little pick list of labor on the left-hand side here. I'm going to hit export. And I don't have to type the labor onto my work order. It actually exports it. So you export the file, you drop into the commander work order, you tap that import button again, and the labor goes right in. And it would go in at your shop rate. So if your shop rate was 95, we set it up so it brings it in at the exact rate that you're billing it. And so when you click that import button, that those two labor lines drop right in. And again, you don't have to type in the labor. It's bringing them in from Service Manager Pro onto your estimate. Now, a lot of this stuff, you know, you can, you can do this stuff exponentially faster when somebody isn't explaining it. You understand that me explaining it to you, I've got to go slow. But when the guys are actually using it, they're just powering through this and they're creating, you know, pretty sophisticated estimates in a matter of 15 minutes that might otherwise take over an hour. Some of them have to call the dealership to get information, you know, that don't have the same expertise that you do. But those are the two different ways of bringing in labor. One is just to type it in and you're manually populating the time value. The other one is to bring it in from Service Manager Pro. These labor lines can be positioned anywhere on the ticket that you want. And to the point of tasking, if you have a labor operation and a number of parts associated, and this is all part of one job, they can be set up so that you have a tasking assignment. And if this is part of job one, that tasking column becomes part of one job. I'm going to remove this labor line here. This labor line and these parts, I'm going to right click and these could have been part of job two. So you can have multiple tasks set up. And as long as these tasking, this tasking column is populated, this is what actually creates the separation on the ticket so that when you present the estimate or the final bill, it creates that separation and gives you a subtotal. Now, if it's an estimate and you just want to send it to the customer, you just save it. You can email it to them right from here and they get a copy of the estimate. But if the customer is actually green lighting you to go ahead and do the job, all you have to do is post the ticket up there in the top left and that flips it from an estimate into an actual open active work order. It tags all the parts that need to be special ordered. Look at that on the right hand side. All those parts have to be special ordered because I don't have them. And I can go to my PO pad. We know they've already been written down for us. So let's minimize all this stuff here. Shoot across to the commander PO pad, top left corner. And we're going to see all of those parts are there. There's the customer's name right there. And all those parts have been written down for us on the PO pad. Now, you can see that the PO pad doesn't care about who the supplier is. There's MidUSA, there's Harley, there's V-Twin, WPS, Parts Unlimited, whatever. But at some point in time, as you were asking earlier about creating purchase orders, you go to the purchase order module, which is that little shopping cart right there. It's going to launch a purchase order tab and you can create a new purchase order. Right click, add the parts. Adding the parts to the purchase order is simple as dragging your mouse down over. In this case, I've just got two parts on limited items and I would select those and put them on the order. But just in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the parts for that customer's bike even though they're from different suppliers. And that's that's essentially what you'll do when it's Temecula. When you're dealing with Temecula and you have to order a Honda, Yamaha, and Cowie parts all on the same purchase order, you'll drag your mouse down over and you won't care that they're Honda, Yamaha, or Cowie because they're all going to be coming from Temecula. So the ability to select different OEMs onto the same purchase order 
is actually a cool feature when you're dealing with one supplier that's supplying all your OEM parts. In this particular case, I would have separated these onto separate orders because that's a distributor order, but you create the order for drag. And so that's how you create it. You just drag and drop the parts onto an outstanding purchase order. And our purchase order routines are in the top dead center there. There's an export button. And that export button allows you to push your purchase order out in a drag format if you wanted to, or WPS if you were ordering from WPS. And so we have these different routines written that export the order out. And basically, you don't have to type all those parts into the drag shopping cart. If you log into Dragnet Web, they're going to upload automatically. Or if you're ordering from WPS or Tucker or whoever, the same thing. You're just doing an export, and that takes care of pushing a file. When the purchase order arrives, when the parts actually come in, you've got a receive button here. And this is where you can receive the order. You can print barcode labels. You can adjust the cost. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can enter the bill. I just skipped the bill entry and we're going to go ahead and receive that purchase order. So everything that comes in is now marked as received. There's a special order call list we can print. Let's just do it for today to see what came in. And we're going to see the parts that we received for repair order 112. So it actually breaks it down by customer and by job. So if you had multiple customers, you know, multiple jobs on the go when the parts came in, they would all be separated. So it's kind of like a parts allocation list, tells you where everything's got to go. You can go back to that uh, work order, 1112. That's the one we're working on. We'll pop it open. And now the parts are here. So those flags have changed to blue on the right-hand side there. So it's letting me know they're here. But of course, once I come back to start working on the work order, those go away. And it's letting me know that all those parts have been received. So this is how we do the work orders. The labor lines, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, can be assigned. I don't know how many techs you have at your shop. If you're the only tech, your name will already be down here. You can pre-assign your name to the labor code. If you've got multiple techs, you may choose at this point to select the technician that's actually doing the work. So let's say Bob Jones is doing this one, and this labor line has been done by a different tech. You can actually choose different technicians and assign them to different jobs, even though they were, they could, so essentially they could have two techs working on the same bike if you wanted to. Technicians will then get credit for the billable hours because they've been assigned to the labor line. There's a time clock down at the bottom. If you want people to clock in and out of jobs, they can clock in. So Bob is clocking in, he goes to lunch, clocks out, clocks in again, clocks out. And eventually we have a time value that accumulates, uh, which we would call actual time, or he could just type in two hours if he took two hours, or maybe it took 2.5, and you could just make that entry there. So we're looking at the three features available down in the bottom left-hand corner. One was the technician assignment, uh, one was the time clock, and then there's also a scheduler. So if I needed a tech and I think it's gonna be two hours and I schedule that, that actually puts it on a calendar and it sends Bob Jones's name to a calendar. And that could be scheduling a pickup or a delivery or a, you know anything, it doesn't really matter. Let's say we needed this tech for three hours, just as an example, we scheduled Dave. So I scheduled the one tech for two hours, the other tech for three, just as an example. So I'm going to minimize the work order for a second here. And I'm going to go into the calendar, which is up here in the top left. And this is a technician's calendar that's actually tied directly to the work order. So if you're scheduling things for techs, each tech gets a different color and the jobs are teed up for them here. So, And you can choose the color associated with the technicians. This one here for Dave is not a very good color. You can't really see the text very clearly on it. But as you can see, the jobs are, are locked out. So there's Bob for two hours, there's Dave for three. So if your shop you know, wants, wants to use a calendar like this to schedule work orders, so you can tell customers you know, when you think you can look at their bike. When you're available or have a tech available to look at their bike, you can do that. To cashier the ticket, we go to the checkout window here, and that opens up the payment window. The service ticket is on here at $808, including tax. Shop fees actually can be computed automatically. If you decide you just want 10 bucks on every work order, you could do that or you could actually ask the system to calculate a value. And you don't have to go in here every time to do it, but it could be calculated as a percentage on the labor total of parts and labor. Usually people do it just on labor. So either three, four or 5% of the labor total and you don't have to go in there, that 597 would be sitting there automatically for you when you went to the checkout window. 
We just okay, and uh, talking about this screen, I see uh, tax. Does this have the ability to separate taxable items from like labor to like parts there is tax on? Like we're in a state where we do not tax labor. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, labor would go on there as non-taxable. Parts would go on there okay. as taxable. Okay, that's what I was wondering too. Yeah, that is no problem. Okay, so we're cashiering the ticket at $814 down there in the bottom right of the checkout window. These are the payment methods, cash, check, debit card, credit card, gift card. You could put it on accounts if you did open account. Not very many people do that in Power Sports. But let's say he was paying it on a credit card. And we do have merchant services integration where Commander can tie in with Global World Pay. And a little window pops open here and you click Process and that'll take care of collecting the money at the same time as you cashier the customer. And I'm going to show you a slide on that in just a second. But I'm going to go ahead and print the ticket here, and I'm going to cashier it. So I'm invoicing it at this point. I could also email it. And that's going to print the final service ticket. Now, as far as the formats that print on the actual service ticket themselves, there's a variety of different templates and, and print styles. And to your point about separating the jobs into separate subtotals for each job done, you can kind of see how it broke them down into separate subtotals. So you can do your estimates that way. You can do your final bill that way, and it'll do the separation. You can actually even put in a job title if you wanted to up here. There's a, there's a way to enter a, uh, a descriptor next to the actual task itself. But that's giving you the separation of each job task and a separate subtotal. So if the guy were to ask you, you know, well, how much did you charge me to do my bearing assembly or whatever? You could say, well, parts were 92 bucks, labor was 170, you know, that job was 262. Mm -hmm. The really powerful module, the service module works really, really well. If you think about all the integrations associated with it from the from the cross-reference to the uh, warehouse stock check feature to the parts fish integration with HLSM to the labor guide integration with SMP. No one in the V-Twin industry had seen anything like this. And still, I don't believe there's any company in the v software industry now catering to V-Twin that has the functionality and the features that we do. So, you know, going back to 2011, when we first introduced this, I mean, we signed up four or 500 V-Twin shops in a short space of time because they were going, man, our industry has been waiting for this forever. We've been waiting for a feature like this to come along that gave us this functionality. You know, Talon may have had some of these features, but keep in mind, as a V-Twin dealer, nobody had these features available to them. Everybody was flying blind, mm -hmm. you know, guessing at the labor times, and doing a lot of manual work to get this information. So, so that's the service module that we just looked at, and I'm just gonna power through some of these additional slides here. You can also create a kit or a common job and use that on a service ticket if you want to. So that just brings in a list of parts and labor so you don't have to create the job every single time you do it. We looked at this HLSM and Service Manager Pro integration, which brings in the, uh, the parts from the fish and the labor times. We just looked at that. QuickBooks integration, I don't recommend it for power sports dealers just because you don't have a lot of open accounts. But if, if somebody wants to tie Commander and QuickBooks together, we do have a module that for 475 and 50 bucks a month is an accounting integration piece that, that hooks Commander and QuickBooks together through this mapping utility that you see Essentially, what it does is it adds the customers to QuickBooks. So if you add a customer to Commander, it'll put the customer in QuickBooks. It sends the invoices and the work orders across into QuickBooks. Any money that you collect is pushed across to QuickBooks, so it goes into undeposited funds. And any bills that need to be paid on product that you're purchasing will transfer into the QuickBooks Payables module. So it does this kind of duplication. It's really just duplicating data that you already have in Commander. So you can use QuickBooks as a backend for Commander and not have them integrated. Essentially, you do your bill pay and your payroll and your banking in QuickBooks. Those are things that QuickBooks does that Commander does not do. So we don't handle bill pay, you know, writing a check out of our system. We don't do banking. We don't have your bank accounts in our system. Those are things that people might consider using QuickBooks for. And it is currently only on the desktop version, so it's not QuickBooks Online. 
QuickBooks Online is not at all capable of handling the data that we're pushing across. At some point in the future, it might be. This is the merchant services slide. So again, I mentioned that if you want to integrate your merchant processing, we are with Global World Pay, and this is the phone number down here at the bottom. I don't quote the rates, but this is a slide that I like to show during the demo. If somebody wants to get rates from them, you've got to call them directly. They'll take a look at your merchant statement. Typically, they'll undercut it because they're the largest merchant provider worldwide. Uh, they bought Thesis, and so they're a behemoth of a company. A lot of bank, a lot of banks actually do the merchant processing through Global. And this, that's a way that when you go to the checkout window in Commander and you're cashiering somebody and you go to checkout, if you choose credit card as a payment method here, a little window pops open, you click the process button and you don't have to key in the amount. It just collects the money at the same time. So that's the integrated merchant processing that we have available. Data conversion, I'm just going to mention, I, I don't know that you're coming off another system. Aren't you doing, are you doing everything manually? You're doing it by hand or how are you doing it now? Yep, I'm doing it all manually, handwritten work orders and stuff. Okay, so this is not applicable to you, but just for purposes of the recording, if somebody was coming off another system, you know, another dealer management system and switching to Commander, we charge $250 to convert your customer list, the parts inventory, all the bikes, and we pull that data from your existing system. And uh, that's a huge time saver when people are switching to Commander, not having to do the manual entry of re-inputting that data. We don't do any transactional data, so we don't convert any invoices or work orders or whatever, which now brings us to the pricing slide for Commander. So we can go through this together. I like to put pricing in here because all our pricing is actually published. So unlike, you know, Talon and Lightspeed and some of these other companies that have really exorbitant pricing, our, our pricing is actually very, very reasonable. If you look at it, we've got a, a startup price for one computer. There's a buy-in of 2,400 bucks and that's a one-time buy-in and then you're done and then you pay a hundred bucks a month after that. If you're doing, yes. if you're doing two computers, it adds $500 to the price. It would be a $2,900 buy-in and the monthly would go up to 120. If you're doing three computers, you add $250 to the price. So the total price would be 3150. And then after that, you would pay 130 a month. So the initial buy-in includes the installation and it includes the training. So we're gonna install it for you. We're gonna set it all up for you. And we're also going to train you. That does not include the QuickBooks interface, and the monthly does not include the HLSM fish or the labor guides. So remember, each of those products are fifty dollars a month. So if you are paying, you know, one twenty or one thirty a month for three computers, and you wanted the labor guides, you would add fifty bucks a month to that. So you'd be at one eighty. If you were adding the if you were adding the fish and the labor guides, your your one thirty becomes two thirty essentially. It just adds a hundred bucks. Each of those are subscription products separately. The renewal that we have, the monthly renewal though, includes quite a lot. It includes all your price updates for all your vendors. So you know you're gonna have updated parts prices. It includes all your technical support, all your ongoing training. So if you hire a new parts guy or a new service guy or whatever, six months from now they can get trained. There's no additional cost. And it includes it includes all the software updates. So you remember when you were working as a beta dealer helping Talon develop, they were probably constantly coming out with software updates and adding new features, right? Changing things, you were making recommendations and they were changing things. In our particular case, what we're doing is we have software updates that you don't pay anything additional for. As long as you're paying your monthly subscription, you get all the new features that we come out with at no additional cost and we just update you. So one of the mm. new not one of the new features in Commander was this color coding that we released so that people had a way of adding themes and colors. And there's a lot of other new features in this version as well, but that was considered a software update and everybody got that automatically. There's no minimum contract. We're not locking you in, you know, there's no five year, you know, you're locked in, you can't leave. A lot of the companies are doing that. That pricing doesn't include any of the scanners or barcode printers or whatever. If you need those, you purchase those separately. The software is going to be delivered through a download. And then after you download, we're going to connect in and we're going to install it for you. So we're actually going to do that at no additional cost. You're going to be able to get set up 
one of our techs will actually call you and install it for you. And then you get an invitation to a training class that we host every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, there's a training class and you can connect in. New dealers take that class typically and new hires. So if one year from now you hire a new parts guy or service guy, just tell them to take the Wednesday training class and away you go. There's technical support available after that. And we have a tech support department available Monday through Saturday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So there's good coverage as far as tech support goes. And we have a ton of videos on our website if you want to do training through uh, video training. And that's basically it for all the slides. We accept all you know brands of, of obviously all uh, credit cards, all the way from Amex to MasterCard, Visa, whatever. Those are all payment options for you. And we also do an electronic check by phone if you wanted to pay that way directly from your account. The only other thing we haven't looked at is the system comes loaded with reports and I don't, I'm not gonna keep you to go through them. Just to mention that we do everything through general ledger. So there's a chart of accounts, everything gets set up. So you'll know the cost and sale price on everything you're selling and what your profit snapshot is gonna look like. We're going to keep track of things like how much money is in the cash drawer at the end of the day, what your sales tax liability is, your technician recap does all your billable hours for your technicians, unit transactions does all your bike sales. The inventory reports are great all the way from inventory valuation to your top selling items. If your drag rep comes in and you just want to run a list of your top sellers, your top 50 items from drag within whatever time period you could view it, it would show that to you. We do inventory sales history. That's a three-year snapshot of sales history. Obsolescence is a report that does all the items that are not selling. So you can pick the time period if your drag rep comes in and you go, hey, last time here, you know, you had me buy this stuff, but look at this. None of this stuff has sold in the last year. And I have greater than, you know, three on the shelf or whatever. So it's almost like overstock.com. It's letting you know all the stuff that you're overstocked on. We have an inventory taking routine for taking for, for taking physical inventory at the end of the year. It creates all your count sheets and you can even use the barcode scanner to dump in the scan. Once you're taking inventory, you can, you can save your scan, merge the files and import them uh, into the count sheets. There's a custom report generator. If there's a report we forgot to write, you can actually create your own reports using this, export them into Excel, manipulate the data. Some people like to do that. But for the most part, that's that's pretty much it. That's that's the end of the demo, unless you have any questions. Nope, that is a very robust system. Um, it's impressive.